it was just a creepy story that we all knew. The kind of story that flew around the school when Halloween was close and kids were trying to scare each other. It had been handed down by our parents, who heard it from their parents, and so on down the line. But no one really believed it. As the story goes, around 120 years ago, there was a witch who lived just outside of town. Surprisingly, the locals didn't fear or hate her, being more inclined to ask for her help to heal the sick. She would mix up potions and recite incantations, usually making a big show out of using her magic. Looking back, it sounds like what she was doing was just really advanced medicine, but the people back then weren't always good at seeing the difference between science and magic. This was especially true in a small town in the middle of nowhere in Idaho. One night, the witch was making her way home after helping a family with a sick child when she was attacked. Her screams echoed through the town, waking everyone and bringing men with guns to the place where her body lay in shambles. She was alive, though barely, and they moved her to the nearest house and tried to help her the best they could. In the end, their efforts were in vain, and the witch would die before the sun rose the next morning. No one had seen her attacker, and the culprit was never brought to justice. The witch's body was laid to rest in the small cemetery on the edge of town following a beautiful funeral, though her spirit seemed to be unaware of this. Shortly after the funeral, people began to report sightings of the witch along the stretch of road that she had been killed on. When she wasn't walking the road, it was said she would wander the cemetery where her body lay, looking for a new body to inhabit. This was, of course, just a story. The witch was never named, and there was no proof she even existed. Despite this, an annual tradition of driving up the one-lane road to the cemetery where she was supposedly buried was born. The date of her death was pinned to October 31st, and teens would swear every year to have seen her ghost, even if they knew it was only their friends pranking them. I had avoided the area every year as I grew up, getting laughs from all my friends who said I was just too scared to go up there. The truth was that I just didn't care for the silly antics of other kids my age. There was nothing spooky about the cemetery or the road, and since it wasn't spooky, it wasn't fun. I knew there were no ghosts. I had been to the cemetery at night plenty of times. My parents would fight, and I would sneak out of the house to avoid it. Often, I found myself wandering between the headstones, reading the names and wondering what their lives must have been like. As the years passed, I found that old cemetery to be one of the most relaxing places in the world. Whenever the world got to be too much, I would go out and walk among the dead. It was like visiting a group of old friends, where the names became familiar, and I would even spend time talking with some of them as if they could hear me or talk back. I invented stories for each of them, not knowing what their lives were really like, making up the details based on when they died. In my mind, these people were my best friends, even if they were all buried six feet underground. Not long ago, on a cold day in February, I was having one of those days that made me want to visit my friends at the cemetery. A customer at the coffee shop I worked at had berated me because we were out of the blend he liked. Another snowstorm had come through and brought with it enough cold air to kill the battery in my car, and I had twisted my ankle walking on ice. It felt like things couldn't get any worse. I was on the verge of tears by the end of my shift, and I knew there was only one place I could go to feel better. Clocking out and telling my coworkers I would see them tomorrow, I started the walk to the cemetery. The snow was piled much higher than I anticipated, but I managed to make it up the hill and through the old rusty gate. Making my way through the rows, I thought about what life might be like if I got out of this small town. Maybe I could go off to school somewhere. I never really imagined myself doing anything other than what I did day to day, but maybe there was something more out in the world. I could always just take some time and travel like some of my high school friends had done after graduation. A couple of them had even met the love of their lives and settled down in warm, sunny places. Then I started thinking about how some of my friends in the cemetery might have wound up here. 
how many of them had actually traveled from places out in the world to this small town? What drove them to decide to settle in such an inhospitable place? As my thoughts filled with possibilities, I noticed something out of the ordinary near the back of the cemetery. There was a small bench I hadn't noticed before, and on it there was a person. Rubbing my eyes, I had to do a double take to make sure I wasn't seeing things. A little old lady was sitting, huddled, on a bench near an old stone. It was one of the stones that had worn away with time, hiding the identity of the interred. Deciding the woman must be real, I made my way over to see if she was okay. As I approached, the smell of lilac filled my nose and I imagined spring had arrived. She stared at the old stone, ignoring my presence as I crept closer. Not wanting to startle her, I cleared my throat before speaking. Uh, hello miss, are you alright? I said, walking closer and removing the hood of my coat. At first, she remained silent, continuing to stare at the stone and not acknowledging me at all. I was starting to think that she was maybe unable to hear me when her tired voice broke the silence. I've seen you here before, dear. You spend a lot of time walking this ground. Are you searching for something? I just enjoy the peace. There's a certain calm here, I said. Something about the old woman was familiar. I have many friends buried in this place. You're right about the calm, though some days are nicer than others. There was a slight quiver in her voice as she spoke. I haven't seen you here before. Are you a local? I asked. I lived here a long time ago. So much has changed since then, though much is still the same. You may have heard of me. They called me Abigail Stevens, the old woman said, a tear rolling down her cheek. I'm sorry, I don't recognize the name. I don't even think there's anyone with the name Stevens left in town. I was starting to worry that the poor woman had some kind of mental issue like dementia. Her eyes looked so sad and she seemed to stare right through me. After all I did for them, they didn't even bother to save my memory. Oh, it isn't your fault, dear, Abigail said, a small smile breaking the corners of her mouth. It's been a long time after all, and I'm sure they were all ready to forget and put what happened behind them. It was such a sad night after all, especially for me. She was staring back at the old stone as she spoke. By now, the wind had picked up a little more, chilling me to my very bones. Something was off about this woman, but I couldn't tell exactly what. I found myself wanting to know more, wanting to find out just who Abigail really was. So, something happened that caused you to leave? I asked. In a way, yes. You see, I was a doctor back before women could aspire to such heights. I had grown up in a family of doctors, being the only child of my parents who were unable to have any more after I was born. My father would have preferred a son who could go off to medical school and carry on the family legacy, but he settled for teaching me what he could. He would let me diagnose patients and suggest cures, all under strict supervision, of course. I had learned more than enough to start my own practice by the time he passed away when I was 29. But a woman couldn't possibly be a doctor in New York. I moved here to Willow Creek, hoping that a small mining town would be more open to the idea. But I found the same problems I faced back east, at least until the mine explosion. I couldn't take my eyes off the woman, who looked like she was in a different place as she spoke. Her face almost seemed to be glowing, and I noticed the daylight around us had faded significantly. The sound of an owl in the distance brought an unexpected shiver down my spine as she continued. After I saved the precious miners' lives, they started to sing my praises all over town. Of course, the cause of the explosion was never determined, lucky for me. More and more people began bringing their sick and wounded to me for treatment. They couldn't admit a woman knew anything about medicine, so they told themselves I was using magic to help them. 
Things were going rather well for me, at least until little George Francis fell ill. I did everything I could think of to save him, but in the end his ailment was beyond even my help. His mother was inconsolable and couldn't understand why I refused to save her boy. I tried to tell her I did everything I could, but a mother's grief is unlike anything else in the world. I was walking home one night after visiting a patient when she confronted me. I didn't see the axe in her hand until it was too late. Not that I would have done anything to stop her. I couldn't even blame her for what she'd done. When they asked me who had hurt me, I feigned ignorance. I watched them bury me, but I couldn't bring myself to leave. If only I could have saved her son, maybe things would have turned out differently. I've been waiting here in this spot ever since. As she finished speaking, I realized I was no longer standing next to her. I was now sitting in the snow, leaning against the blank stone and staring up at her. I couldn't feel my arms or legs, and I knew hypothermia must be setting in. As I stared, she stood up and knelt down beside me, her lips only inches from my ear. Thank you for helping me, my dear. I promise it won't hurt, and I'll do great things through you, she whispered, placing her hand on my chest. The last thing I remember was hearing her take a deep breath before a blinding light overtook me and I passed out.